like we're ready to go, folks. Welcome to the Plan Commission meeting for December 15th. For those that have had not had the pleasure of attending a meeting before, uh, first of all, we ask that you turn off your cell phone so you don't be bothered by those during the meeting. Uh, second of all, the way the agenda works is city staff will present on an item. After that, it's open to the commission for technical questions. Once we're done with our technical questions, we open it up to the members of the audience to speak. If you choose to do so, please step up to the microphone and state your name and address so we have it for the minutes. After all, people who have chosen to speak have done so. We close public commentary, bring it back to the commission for discussion and usually a vote. And with that, let's call the roll. David Borsak. Present. Ed Bowen. Jeffrey Tomes. Here. Thomas Voitek. Here. John Hintz. Here. Steve Cummings. Here. Kathleen Trapp. Here. Gary Gray. Here. Donna Laurie. Robert Feiger. Here. Carl Nolenberg. In attendance. All right, and approval of the minutes from December 1st, 2015. Do we have anything to correct on? Move to accept. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nobody. Motion clearly passes. Let's move on to item number one, architectural building plan review for a proposed storage building at 425 Lakeshore Drive at the water filtration plant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. AECOM on behalf of the City of Oshkosh is requesting an architectural building plan review for construction of a storage building to be located at the City's water filtration plant at 425 Lakeshore Drive. Up on the screen, I have an aerial photo showing the, the entire site as a whole. Subject site is currently the, the home of the city's water filtration plant, which was constructed in 2000. Uh, in addition to the main plant facility itself, there are several, um, several other accessory buildings um, helping facilitate the site. Uh, the site is uh, zoned R2, two-family residence district, and is surrounded by residential uses to the south, I mean to the west, residential and commercial to the south, Menominee Park to the north and Lake Winnebago to the east. It's just a little closer up view. This project is uh, one fa or one part of a couple other projects going on at the site. Uh, the project includes select demolition and new construction around the pump station and the focus of this request is uh, construction of a new storage, fa uh, storage facility uh, which is to be located about right in the center of the site just uh, east of the off street parking area here and between the uh, service driveway uh, leading off of Washington Avenue. Uh, the petitioner states that construction will not interfere with uh, water treatment operations and should not affect the surrounding properties at all. Let's see, next slide here. This is a uh, uh, site plan submitted by the petitioners showing the proposed location and this is a close-up of it. The proposed storage building is planned to be approximately 31 feet 4 inches wide by 37 feet 4 inches deep and approximately 1,170 square feet in size. The building is going to have two overhead doors on the west elevation and one single one on the east elevation. Um, the doors on the west elevation will connect directly to the main parking area, which will result in the loss of a couple stalls. And then on the east side, they're going to uh, uh, construct an asphalt addition leading to the driveway coming off Washington Avenue. Okay, this is a shot showing the proposed elevations of the building. Um, again, this is the westerly elevation with the two overhead doors. The easterly ev elevation with the single one leading to the driveway off of Washington Avenue. And then the north and south elevations are similar, um, no articulation at all. I'll get back to that in a second. And just a kind of a floor plan showing the proposed use, a couple of vehicle storage and um, landscape equipment. The proposed materials, let's see, yep, here we go. The proposed materials will be similar to the surrounding on-site buildings in color and material, which is uh, red brick exterior walls and a uh, metal roof. Uh, staff, did, staff did note the lack of articulation on the north and south, uh, north and south elevations. Uh, due, the, due, the, due, the, uh, due to the proposed location of the building, let me go back to the overall site plan here. Uh, the building is uh, located r uh, rather far from any public street, about 150 feet from Lakeshore Drive and 300 feet from Washington Avenue. In addition to those distances, 
The proposed storage building is going to be partially partially <coughs> shielded by two existing structures. So staff uh, mulled around with this a little bit, and we are comfortable with the lack of articulation on the north and south elevations. Uh, we don't feel it's going to have a detrimental effect on the neighborhood, and uh, staff is comfortable with the uh, design as proposed. Uh, with that, the project is included uh, for or scheduled for construction in 2016 and is included in the 2016 capital improvement program. And staff is recommending approval of the architectural design of the pro proposed storage building as proposed. All right, thank you. Technical questions, Jeff. Two quick questions. Is there any landscaping proposed on those two ends that you're you're talking about on the articulation and two? assume that this building isn't big enough to cause any problems with storm water during site plan review um, based on a small scale of the building it may kick in some additional landscape requirements i don't know if it's been the site plan review yet you know dave no so it'll be reviewed at that time and if additional landscaping is required it'll be installed mm -hmm. storm water storm water Assistant Director Gordy can address that. Given the limited square footage, I don't anticipate it, but again, during site plan review, that's one of the items that will be checked. Great. Other technical questions? All right. Seeing none, anyone here from the public to speak to this item today? Once, twice. All right. Back to the commission. Motion to approve. Second. And moved and seconded to approve. Are there any discussion on the move? Seeing none, let's call the roll. Cummings? Aye. Bob? Aye. Weigert? Aye. Nolenberger? Aye. Orsak? Aye. Bowen? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Hans? Aye. Poitek? Aye. Motion carried 9 0. Moving on to item number two, development plan review for the reconstruction of the parking facility for the Oshkosh Senior Center at 200 North Campbell Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> um, everybody probably knows where the Senior Center is. This is the Oshkosh Senior Center South uh, facility. Um, so it is located on Campbell Road uh, to the north. Uh, you can see it's zone C2, general commercial plan development. To the north, you have the Senior Center North facility and some condos. Um, to the south, you have Fox Valley Tech, and directly across Campbell to the west um, is the facility <coughs> building for the university. This is an aerial view, sort of zoomed in a little bit, of the site as it currently exists today. It's about two and three quarter acre site. Um, it received a um, planned development in 1993 for the construction of the building itself, a 31 stall parking lot um, and 16 trailer parking stalls. Uh, since that time, it had, well, here's a, a site plan showing the existing conditions. Um, since that time, the parking lot was restriped um, to increase the amount of parking to 52 stalls and 19 trailer stalls. Uh, the site itself also, um, go back, beyond just the senior center itself, uh, has the um, Steiger Park boat launch um, and also part of this lot continues down. It has part of the river walk uh, on this part of the uh, part of the river. So this is the uh, proposed alterations. Um, setbacks for after the proposed alterations would remain the same. There would be no impact to the to the uh, uh, to the site in that respect. There are two major changes that kick in. Well, there's m several changes, but two big ones. One is the inclusion of this linear um, parking lot island that runs the full length of the northern parking lot um, that would also act as a biofiltration system. There would also be biofiltration here in sort of this large green space that also contains a gazebo. Um, a dumpster is being proposed to be located here in front of the building within the frontage of uh, North Campbell Road. Um, that is being proposed to be a hardy board uh, sided enclosure to be painted to match the senior center building itself. Um, some of the other changes here as well, they would retain two access drives onto Campbell, one going to the south lot, one going to the north lot. Um, there is a internal connection going to the Fox Valley Tex parking. If I can get that on the aerial, you might be able to see it right here. 
Um, that will be removed as part of this reconstruction. I'll go back to the site plan itself. Um, so those two drives would, would still remain. Um, the parking lot layout would change a little bit. There would now be 48 stalls and 20 trailer stalls. Um, out of those 20 trailer stalls, one would become a handicap stall and we would retain 17 handicap stall parking uh, for the regular parking lot itself. Um, another significant difference um, in this site is the pedestrian access. You'll see there's a striped sidewalk over the drive <coughs> lane, but there's a sidewalk <coughs> now leading from Campbell Road to the front, of the front entrance of the building. It's an entrance here and an entrance here. Um, additionally, there's striped uh, walkways um, that lead through the parking lot to get to the North uh, Senior Center facility uh, parking lot. And also there is a walkway that goes in between the two buildings that runs down to the river and runs out to Campbell Road. Um, so those are significant changes um, to the site for the two walks. You'll also see the connection of the existing river walk enters into this parking lot as well, which you could then connect down to through the parking lot to Campbell Road. Campbell Road is designated in the uh, pedestrian and bicycle plan as a uh, bicycle route. It has received Shero treatments, um, so it is a designated route with paintings on the, uh, on the street. So I received that this year. Um, as far as landscaping for the site goes, uh, there is a landscape plan that was submitted. Um, we have not reviewed it as far as site plan review goes. The original plan development um, contained language in it uh, primarily because of its location near the river and inclusion of the park property um, that the landscape plan be approved by the Parks Department in 1993. Um, staff does concur with that original recommendation and also because of the significant amount of utilities located within the setback areas uh, making code compliance very difficult for landscaping um, if not impossible, as well as de desirability to keep views of the river from the facility itself. <coughs> um, we are suggesting that the landscape for the project be approved by the Department of Community Development. Uh, that being said, there are minimum code requirements that will have to be met during site plan review, so there's no base standard modification to that here, um, but that the landscape plan be approved by staff. As I had mentioned before, stormwater on the site right now is, is virtually non-existent stormwater management. Um, so the addition of these biofiltration areas are going to do uh, quite a bit for stormwater improvements. Additionally, it doesn't show on this plan here, but the parking stalls in the south parking lot, except for the drive aisle, the rest of this parking lot would be permeable pavers. So um, kind of a new concept for the city. We don't use them a lot. The university has used them, um, but this would be... I think one of our first, if not our first, installation of permeable pavers in the parking lot so the stormwater can drain through the, through the pavers itself. Um, so with that uh, being said, we, are, um, we believe the proposed redevelopment meet the standards of the plan development section of the code, won't have a negative effect on surrounding land uses um, or the property itself, and we're recommending approval with two conditions, base standard modification to allow the refuse enclosure to be located in the front yard, and that the landscape plan be approved by the Department of Community Development. All right, tactical questions. Ed and Gary. Just a clarification, David. You mentioned permeable pavers. In the staff report, it says permeable pavement. The permeable pavement. And James will probably be able to explain that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, we're, we're still evaluating whether it's going to be a permeable pavement, i.e. pervious pa asphalt or pervious concrete, or whether it's permeable paver blocks. Okay. Um, but it will be a permeable pavement surface of one okay. of those types. I was just more curious if, if there was a, you know, disconnect between one or the other but you're still evaluating yeah, yeah we're still evaluating the uh, the benefits and the cost and the life okay. cycle of all of the types of permeable pavements and then there's you know the underground storage you know right. gravel filled storage system that goes along with the permeable pavements to help provide the treatment and and storage of the stormwater that comes in through the pavement. okay it's great either way I think it's, it's a great thing to try so I'm just more curious I was curious about the wording in the staff report so thank great. you uh, James, I have a question for you, I think. Uh, in regards to this permeable pavement or uh, crossroads, uh, how come only half the parking lot is 
going to be covered with this? Why not the whole parking lot? Well, per permeable pavement systems are more susceptible to damage from turning movements. So therefore, you would want just the parking stalls and not the drive aisles, because as you're starting to turn out of that drive aisle, that's where you really are seeing a lot of extra stress from the tires on the pavements. Okay. Um, so that is one of the big challenges with them. Um, with the uh, with the northern half of the lot, um, we were we were able to do the treatment um, with uh, a biofilter uh, versus ha um, the permeable pavement. So it, it's kind of using both strategies to meet the requirements. Okay, uh, is is this more more expensive than the regular pavement? It, it is a little bit more expensive than the traditional pavements, but we're able to incorporate the uh, the stormwater management as a part of the pavement system as a whole. So it provides some significant benefits because you can see on the south half of the lot, there really is no room to do even a biofilter to provide treatment. So we really had to uh, come up with some alternative means to, to meet the requirements of stormwater management codes and still preserve the amount of parking and site space that was needed. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a fantastic uh, 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 mythology and uh, a mythology, and I, I would hope that the city would consider doing this on some other parking lots in the future. Uh, my next question is: uh, This proposal is just for the south parking lot, not the north parking lot. Well, it's for, it's oh. for both of the parking lots of the south facility, the south senior center facility. There's okay. two, two so, facilities. So, 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 so it's, it's it's both parking lots, and not not just the one parking lot. It, it, right, it doesn't cover the nor the senior center north. Uh -huh. um, it just covers the senior center south building and the two parking lots associated with that. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, I guess that that's all my questions. Right. And if, if if I had a vote, I would vote for it. Okay, John and then Jeff. Staying on the same topic while you're here, I know we have um, ordinances against having parking on gravel and on grass. How does the permeable pavement keep those things that we're worried about coming from the vehicles from contaminating the ground? Well, I think the biggest thing with parking, you know, on on grass or on gravel is, you know, just the surface isn't solid. Um, but one of the things, you know, um, the DNR has recently approved administrative codes for stormwater treatment from uh, this type of a system, a permeable pavement system. And it really comes down to, you know, if there are things that leak from the building or from the vehicles, um, the surface area of the stone structure underneath will, will tie them up and o over time, you know, when a reconstruct has to take place, that structure will have to be removed and replaced. Then. Thank you. Jeff? Um, since this is, you, you're, you're tearing up the, the lot down to dirt, right, and redoing it, so that would kick in our new standards for a parking lot, is that correct? Correct. Does this meet those standards as they are written? Because it doesn't appear that the south lot would, because there's there's no landscape islands, all that stuff that we have in the in the standards. So um, the landscape islands kick in in a row of more than 20 stalls. So I don't believe that that um, I don't think there's 20 stalls down there. So to answer well, your question, basically yes, it would have to meet that unless base standard modifications were given. The northern lot has the center refuge or the center island. Um, the south lot, I believe, I believe that's less than 20 stalls across, so it wouldn't kick in a uh, center island. But it would have to have green on both sides, which um, it has the two islands, excuse me, on both sides of both okay. rows. Other technical questions, David. Um, the removal of the uh, access to the uh, to Fox Valley Technical Parking Lot, is, was that by uh, an agreement? Is there anything formal? There, there's no formal agreement uh, that even allows that cro traffic crossing right now. It's just been an amicable kind of, you know, hand handshake type of an agreement. Um, the staff that, or the p most people that use that right now are senior center staff. Um, because there are some staff that, that park over there, and that's who, in our discussions, that's who it's mostly been used by. And, and a follow-up question. Um, are you comfortable with the uh, materials and construction and, and intent appearance of the um, refuse uh, uh, container? Plan planning staff is comfortable with it. The senior center is scheduled, I believe, to be painted, and so it would the painting of the hardy board and closure would match the match the building style and color, which is usually the best we can get is a match. 
Jeff? Um, where the river rock now is going to terminate into the parking lot, is, <coughs> is there any concern about, you know, people coming out of there or riding their bikes out into that parking lot, into that drive aisle without any kind of signage or any kind of markings that, that you know, that, that show where the continuation of that river walk would be? Because otherwise, there, you know, somebody that's not familiar with the river walk and going down there, is there any concern about that kind of, uh, of traffic coming in? <coughs> because it's emptying right into a parking, uh, you know, a, a, a lane, driving lane, without anywhere telling them where the next continuation of the river walk is. Um. So um, I, I would suggest that we, we try to do something like you, like you have when you, you did the um, walkway striping that there, there be something, and at least some kind of warning, but also some kind of indication, or it, maybe it be, be signage saying, you know, the continuation of the river walk is this way, otherwise they're wandering around a parking lot that has quite a bit of traffic in it. No, I think you're right. Some we should look at. Okay. Other technical questions? All right. Anybody here from the audience to speak to this item today? Robert? Bob Cornell, 548 West Smith. Uh, I came to solicit your approval of this. I serve, currently serve as the vice chair of the advisory board of directors at the Escott Senior Center. Uh, I was on the board for six years before term limits caused me to go out to pasture for a year and have come back just this year. Uh, this has been a topic of discussion when I was uh, chair of the board for over four years. And it's a, it's a very much needed improvement. Uh, I spend some time every day in either the north or south facility, and uh, I'm not happy with the parking or the, the condition of the parking lot on the north side, but the south building is, is really not a parking lot that's conducive to senior citizens. Uh, it's been there for a long time. It's like any other thing. Uh, as it ages, it's going to erode. and so. The Board of Directors is very excited to see this come up for discussion. Uh, we think it's a, a definite improvement, and some of the enhancements, uh, I, th I think, are incredible in the thinking of the designers, because especially putting that island in there, uh, I shudder sometimes what I see when people don't want to back out and go out of the south driveway, so they'll cut across. This is going to prevent them from doing it, and, you know, Seniors aren't patient, but they got no place to go. Everybody's in a hurry. <laughs> so this, this, this will prevent, to me, it will be a, a much needed prevention for any type of accident uh, from happening. So I certainly solicit your approval. Thank you, Bob. Question for you. Are, are, go ahead. Are you okay with the amount of um, handicapped parking on the north side versus having more in the south side lot? I, th I think it's more important to have more on the north side because the entrance well there's two entrances one on the north and one on the west uh, the north side entrance is used much more than the west side entrance and it could be logically reasoned that there is more parking on the north side but i i use both what's ever available and uh, from a person who there are days when i do need handicapped parking when i'm not too maneuverable I would prefer more on the north, just from a personal standpoint. Well, and that, that was my question. My questioning is, is that, again, you, know, you have a drive aisle yeah. on that nice north side. So, right. I mean, that works both ways. It's easier to access the, 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 the handicapped spot. But then again, you're having people have to cross across that drive aisle, where on the south side, you wouldn't. So that's, that was why I was just asking okay. whether, you know, your experience with I, I think if I would, would talk to some of the seniors <coughs> at use the center, uh, I think there's currently, I don't know, is there, David, is there 24 or 18, something like that, uh, handicap parking? I think there's 17. 17, okay. Now, depending on who you talk to there, that's half of what you need. But uh, I, I think it's adequate considering the amount of activities and programs that the seniors use it for. and. Uh, the way it is, looks like a great idea. Great, thank you. Anyone else here to speak to this item today? All right, let's bring it back to the commission. 
like to make a motion to add the uh, signage for the uh, river walk extension Second. to that. It's been moved by Bob, seconded by Ed. Any discussion on that motion to add a condition? Let's vote on that. Call the roll for this is to add a condition regarding a signage. Cummins? Aye. Krop? Aye. Weigert? Aye. Nolenberger? Aye. Orsak? Aye. Bowen? Aye. Tones? Aye. Hence? Aye. Poitek? Aye. Motion carried 9 0. Okay. With that, I'd like to make a motion to accept it as uh, revised. Aye. Second. Okay. Sure, who got the second? I think it was David. If I don't no. do it, okay, David's fine. We'll, we'll get you next fine. time, John. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? Respect my elders. All right. Oh, my <laughs> elders. <laughs> Seeing now, let's call the roll. Cummings? He's going to do it. Rob? Aye. 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 Nolenberger? Aye. Borsak? Aye. Bowen? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thanks. Aye. Okay. Aye. All right, there appears to be a list of other business. Gentlemen. Right, the first thing that you have and you receive in your packet, you know, we've been going through all of the articles, there have been 11 of them, of the draft zoning code. We've been doing workshops. Uh, we included inside your package, or inside your packet, a uh, draft copy of Article 1, which is the introduction and definition section. Um, the staff didn't feel that it was really necessary to have a full workshop on definitions, um, but Thank we Thank you. yeah. But we wanted to <laughs> we wanted to provide it to you uh, to take a look at if if there's anything you see you know later on in the week, give me an email, give me a call, um, and uh, you know we'll jot that down and address it. Um, we are hoping at the end of the week or beginning of next week to have a full all article minus signage uh, draft. So starting probably in January, that'll be going through for full review of uh, the Plant Commission and the Working Group again, and then open houses and so on and so forth. Uh, there's probably around 12 to 15, maybe not quite that many. We're trying to get it smaller policy questions that are still up in the air uh, that probably end up getting recommendations from the Working Group Plant Commission, then bring them to the council and let them make the decision. Um, and that's kind of where we are. So this is just information for you if you read through it because it's such great reading um, feel free to feel free to give me a call and um, <coughs> I will great thank you David thank you. Sure. how are you dealing with signage David <laughs> I mean, well, I, like, I know your, hands are, your hands are obviously tied I mean, we, right? we're, we're going to update that chapter uh, we have a proposal in the, that Supreme Court case that came in kind of threw out what we're proposing to do with signage so we've had to kind of modify our contract uh, with Vanduel, the firm, to uh, redraft that uh, that chapter, and we'll be and that our our plan is to get that done all, all in parallel with when we're bringing the rest of the zoning ordinance. You're going to run the the zoning code minus signage through the process. Well, we're going to see where we are. Signage. We're we're hoping to run them at the same time. Right. That's the goal is to run them right. at the same that time. So we think we can get it done in relatively short order because there's a good model out there. Um, and then we'll know a little bit more after the first of the year. But that's the idea. Gary? So I just got a couple of comments, quick comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I, look, I look, uh, looked at the definition saying don't have any additional definitions. One personal suggestion, though, is in regards to the adoption of the zoning code, I, I would strongly urge that the official map be changed to equivalent new zoning and have the zoning map adopted with the zoning code. Now, I, 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 I realize that there are many ways to do the adoption of a map and the code, but I think by uh, approving both of them, you will hopefully not get involved with a lot of politics. That's the end of my comments. All right. We're, uh, the, way, the way the consultant, uh, the way we originally had, had uh, set up the process is we <coughs> were going to adopt the ordinance 
first and then follow up with the text amendment just for just for the what you're talking about is to remove some of the, some of the politics from from the situation because that's based on their experience uh, once you get the ordinance adopted it's actually easier to adopt the the map uh, but I think we're, we're going to take a look at that. We, we're still, we haven't settled on either okay. process. We just want to get okay. the, at this point, we want to, we've been doing this for yeah. many years, a, two, a long time. two years. three years, and we, we really want to get it adopted. So yeah, I, I, before I, anything I, else Before changes. Darren had gray hair. No, no I, I, I understand yeah. that. And, you know, like, said, like I originally said, there are many reasons to do it various other ways. Uh, but uh, uh, it's just my personal feeling that it's more political to wait to do the building map. But, all like right. I said, I, 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 we don't want to argue about it. No, thank you. Uh, next item. Uh, next item uh, we just included this just for uh, an informational thing. There's a flurry of legislation going through right now or being proposed uh, that will affect the ability of uh, the, w the way we lo view it to do some planning that are, that are, you know, some of these bills are of some concern from us. For, uh, and it will affect our ability to do certain things in the community. So we thought we'd, we'd keep it on the list, so at least so you know that it's out there. Um, we'll just go, uh, Mayor Cummings will, will, will touch on something in a minute because he took a contingent down to uh, Madison last week uh, to address one of the bills. AB 523 would allow complete replacement of nonconforming structures if destroyed. That's really a clarification bill. I'm not really, I mean, I don't like it in the first, the, the, I don't like this, the, the provision in the first place. That's really clarifying it. We already allow that based on the state law. Uh, AB, 56, uh, AB 563 would allow Dane County towns to withdraw from county zoning. Um, that's right now, it's Dane County, but what's, what's going to do is there'll be a precedent for, <coughs> for that to happen in every other county. Um, AB 568 probably is one of the more pressing, one of the more concerning ones from our perspective because historic preservation is something that's been important to us and then the whole rental reg regulation inspection that's something the route that we're trying to go down right now the way the bill is written would end us from being able to do that mayor cummings and a contingent went down to madison to testify on that particular bill on thursday and steve if you if you'd like to comment a little yeah, uh, very briefly um all these bills uh, we're being, everyone, there was a lot of people there to testify against everything. Um, um, in a nutshell, uh, my impression was the authors of these bills, this is all very, um, to me it's conflict of interest. It's very uh, self-serving as far as rental inspection as others. Many of the committee members are currently involved in real estate and or have or do own rental properties. Uh, I made the comment that I thought it was a conflict of interest, borderline unethical. They're shoving these through so fast. And we got down there, I, well, I went obviously and um, Councilman Stefanik, who is also a university student, I wanted him to talk about the joys of living in rental property in the university area. And then Bill Wyman went with us to talk about the work we're doing in neighborhoods. Um, uh, there was also a bunch of a group of fire chiefs here to talk about uh, 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 ending the multiple family sprinkler, sprinkler systems. Uh, the, the game they were playing. This was you know, we got we found out about on a Monday. We went down a couple of, couple of days later. All of the lobbyists were there representing all these special interest groups. Um, there was the mayor of La Crosse, there, the city manager of Beloit. Uh, mayor of Waukesha, Waukesha, Eau Claire, and then the mayor of Bayfield, which is a far piece from Madison, went down there to talk specifically about the historic preservation and what it has meant to the economy of Bayfield. Um, <clears throat> uh, that there, is, there is no time limits given to people like we will do at a council meeting. The, the Dane County thing went on for a couple of hours. Our group that got to talk we got three or, three or five minutes because we're running out of time. Um, we finally left at 4.30. Uh, never did hear what the uh, historic preservation people had to say about it, but um, as this bill is proposed, it would totally wipe out what we've been trying to do for how many years to ensure that the that citizens is. of Oshkosh <laughs> have clean, clean safe Ever since I've been here. environments to live in, and not just the university. 
um, this would do away with that. It, as as best I can interpret it, it is it is a uh, the way the bill is drafted. It is a landlord's. I mean, it's just it, it's so anti the homeowner. Well, it's so am, anti the community development. We know what's best to do for Oshkosh. Some clown out of Sockville, who was one of the authors, doesn't know Oshkosh. And get their, get your nose out of our business. We know what we're doing. We know the problems. We know the, the corrections. Um, hey, wait a minute. I'm from Sockville originally, so let's. Uh, but you, 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 <laughs> you, 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 you fit the clown. Yeah. Um, what is it? Three thousand people. Uh, 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 Steve, if this passed, yeah. what would happen if you tested? You tested and just said. We're not doing it. Um, well, we'd go to court. I, go just to like, court. just like the, you know, we're basing we're basing our, our proposal for the for the rental inspection and registry on a on the models from Wass on the Cross that made it through the court system. So we, the the model that we're going to base ours on would be there. So it's been upheld in court. So anything that we would do would go to court. The way the way you do it, uh, the city of Milwaukee when they passed the residency requirement, city of Milwaukee sued, and I think they they ended up overturning that residency pro provision in the state statute. So we'd have to, I think we'd ha you'd have to somehow sue the state. However, that works. You I don't know. That's out of my. That's out of my. You get a feeling that these other cities would would be testing that with those waters too. Uh, I'm sure they would. I, I'm I'm trying to get together a group of the 13 campuses. I mean, this is this is serious. For every campus, every campus has off, off campus housing, most of and most of it most of is in very old sections of cities that have a lot of big old frame, hundred year old tinder boxes. Um, uh, it, I, I, it's it, it's it's just one more example of Madison trying to take away home rule. It's self serving, and I made the comment. I said I'm a realtor, and also as mayor, I said I would find it conflict of interest with what we're doing now if I own rental property. I would, I would find it unethical and I was sort of directing it at some of this committee who I, I think what they're doing is unethical. It, they have a financial gate on this. Some uh, of the other ramifications of some of these as well we don't know for certain but some of the historic preservation regulations would also start falling into design standards for downtown would no longer be enforced because they're based on aesthetics and historic preservation. Some of the design stuff we have in our uh, multifamily and our one and two families could be. David raises, David raises a real important point there. Yeah, could if you read it a certain way, you could read it that it would, you know, we couldn't do design standards at all. So <laughs> we're just a little bit concerned about. So this that. would also drastically affect our <laughs> zoning code rewrite as well, which oh. is, as you all know, heavy on uh, design. But they don't realize that the historic district, there are distinct tax advantages. I'm using it right now in my house. I, I will qualify for 25% tax credit the work I'm having done because my home is, in a, is historic. You know, they overlook that. I mean, that is, when you look what we're trying to do with the, the central city and as far as the uh, uh, neoclassic district, that's the only way that some of these develop developers can afford to either rehab these buildings or maintain the buildings is through the tax credits. Correct. Um, it, it, so I are you saying, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but are you saying that AB 568 would, would remove those tax credits? No. 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 What they're saying is we can't, we could not declare, say, the Main Street as, as a historic district. We could, I think you could do, you just Which can't require people to have right. certain architectural right. treatments. Right. You can't really hold them to right. it. Right. 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 No, I understand. I guess I just wanted to make sure I understood exactly what. I mean, you, they can be designated the historic, building. but they have to agree to it, and right. they don't have to follow any So a district would be unlikely to be formed. You have, you have a district that has that zero teeth, probably, you yeah. know, those things. Right. So you'd have to basically okay. get people together to right. convince right. them to do it. And the way the mayor from Bayfield, if you've ever been to Bayfield, explained it, he said, you know, not everyone gets the concept. That way you, if you had to wait for everyone to get on board. Oh, yeah. He <laughs> said if, if Bayfield hadn't done this, Bayfield would be a ghost town. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's, it, it's true for all our older cities that, you know, we've got to have that we have to be able to do what's best for our community. We don't need, 
other people who don't need don't need a, the don't understand the needs of our community in, to meddle in our affairs. What's the f what's the feeling of our local representatives? Um, we've tried. I think they understand. Mixed. Our, uh, mixed uh, I think. <laughs> I think what we have to do is contact our local representative and make and you know just let's not just sit here and wait for something to happen. Yeah. You know those who are involved in you know, I I've, I've talked to Shirley. I said you know get with your historic cronies and they've got to really put pressure on this stuff. Um, and I, so the university if you have 13 universities saying hey we need to be able to make sure our students living off campus are in living in clean safe environments. Let us do it. We know our cities. Well, you would think you'd. UW total would would have that same concern, you know, across all their campuses, along with you know any other you know colleges and stuff that have well, and even they anywhere can't, they can't because they're public. A private school like Ripon can, yeah. so that we've got to get the student bodies involved. And this is this is a major issue, I think, for the state, and it's a major issue. The impact for homeowners, if, if we've discovered all, all of our neighborhood associations, the biggest complaint from the homeowner is. Rental properties and what they're doing to devalue the, to devalue their investment in their homes. If you look at the details of the bill, it doesn't allow you to do regular inspections um, to enter the property. You know these are rental units, so it, it basically locks the landlord into doing whatever whatever they really like. It also beefs up the ability for them to um, um, kick a tenant out. I don't know. Uh, shortens the time frames and gives them a broader reason to be able to do it um, which you know I don't know which could be easily you complain about my property and you're out I mean not well, officially yeah. but that it could very easily happen well the way th the way that bill is has been written it's it's sort of a one-size-fits-all it doesn't take to consideration there are very good rental operations and there are very bad rental operations and this is you know, there as we've talked about it, it's been working on it. It's you treat the the good a little bit. You, we'll treat the good differently than the bad. I mean, if you've got violations coming out of your ears, we're going to keep knocking on your door, basically. And if if you're a clean bill of health, you know, we're not going to come back for what five years, ten years, whatever. It's three to five. You know, it's you talk to the university students, and there are those rental operations that. Uh, as the kids have said, we know we're not getting a deposit back. It's a, it's a given. It's a, it's, it's a given on campus. If you see some of these places, they've got kids living in basements, which is part, part of this from a living university in. standpoint. Yeah. We, we have very uh, unsophisticated students signing deals that they sign it practically a year before they're even going to be living there. And they really get caught you know and, th and then they're in it and they can't get out of it and they end up in a basement somewhere it's yeah it's it's it's, it's a challenge I have, I have a friend in Illinois whose niece is going to school here she graduates on Saturday but uh, I want her to walk, help them walk move her in and she is living in an attic that gee your window should have glass shouldn't they and gee shouldn't the attic have heat and the problem that we had on, on the fire department <laughs> as inspectors we weren't allowed to go into anything other than three family or more as far as inspections. Public areas too. Right, just the public areas as well. You couldn't get into the units themselves, right? No, we couldn't get into any area. We couldn't inspect any building that had less than three families. Yes, but I'm saying it, when in the multiple families, say a 10 unit, you could get in the common areas. You weren't getting in the We wouldn't area. get into the, yeah. the living units themselves either, but if you can always see certain things that in the common units or the common areas and figure it goes into like extension <laughs> cords under the door right. going out to the hall because their electric's been shut off in their unit i had that happen more than once nice in the case i described if there's a fire she will die she will not there's no way to get out that's of right and it's going to be fast would, that wouldn't be allowed if it was put in our jurisdiction which it, uh, i don't know here's a question goes. for you guys Do you, the newer apartments that have been built, you know, between downtown and campus, are they are, are they occupied at a decent percentage? Because I'm just saying that because there's a lot of a lot of houses around campus that have, thankfully, for rent signs on them, even at this time of year. Because I'm wondering, are people migrating to newer, better? Because the prices aren't all that different. 
I think they, I think they are. I mean, if you look at some of the, the older stuff that's wearing out, you know, in the Elmwood area, I think you're seeing a different demographic. You're not. I think some it's of the students. Student, yeah, I think yeah. Mm -hmm. But so I think they are migrating towards those those units. I think we're even seeing them in some of the newer market rate that yeah, we I, didn't I, anticipate I, them being yeah, in. I, I've so. But you're also seeing the students move further out away from campus, yeah, and then with the same ending up in the same conditions. Uh, uh, question, if these statutes were to pass, mm. since we have home rule powers in this state, could we adopt a local ordinance, charter ordinance or otherwise, which would be different from what the state statute is, since it's obviously not of statewide concern? Of course, right. I've that is beyond me, Carl. I have, don't have that answer. I, really yeah, I remember seeing something in there stating that any local ordinances that contradict are yeah. not allowed to be enforced. So preemption. Yeah, oh, yeah. There's a, there's but a you can do things, you know, for instance, the state statute says we'll have a mayor elected by the rest of the council, <coughs> president of the council, but we adopted a charter ordinance Different. which overrode that. So could we do the same thing in this particular situation since it's issue not a statewide concern? Well, that, that was my question, I earlier, was Carl. But but I, I think to to Steve's point, you know, when you're looking at, and we know we have some certain conditions that are going on in this city. We also have an obligation to protect the, the health and welfare of these citizens, That's right. regardless of what the state law is. And so, you know, when you have those particular situations, because we don't have a cookie cutter approach, you know, that has to approach, which this bill does, <coughs> then that's where, you know, it's almost worthwhile or it's incumbent upon us to test those waters, just like you were talking about, or that Steve was talking about, that we have to test those waters and say, look, if you're going to go to court, we'll go to court because, you know, we're trying to protect our citizens and we're trying to preserve a way of life within. Oshkosh, um, you know, because we are an older city, we do have historical significance in this city, which is part of what our city is about. We aren't going to put in all new buildings that maybe somebody else wants to do. So at some point in time, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I agree with, with, with what you're saying, Steve, that, you know, we need to to get people down there and, and, and contact the people and say, hey, look, this is just a this is a bad deal. You know, if if somebody over here wants to pass an ordinance to, to do all these things that are in this this uh, that's in this bill today, that's their privilege if they if they can get that done in, in, in their city. But to do it blatantly across the the, uh, the state and say everybody's going to be doing the same thing makes little to no sense and some of this stuff doesn't make any common sense if you have situations like a university town where you have people living in substandard areas that are putting them at risk from a safety standpoint like Robert was talking about um, <coughs> that makes no sense to me I mean that's where you know we, we, we should test the waters if this happens to go through well, well we're, 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 not, we're not there. We're not yet there. Yeah. The bill's David's on a fast track, but David's got a wise comment. Is, sure. is there a companion Senate bill for this? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't. At least there's at least two of the ones on this list that have companion bills. I don't think 568 does. I don't believe I'm not so. Sure. I think five. Oh yeah, there, there, yeah, there has to be. Yeah, there, there is because it was introduced by. I think it was introduced. Uh, was sponsored by Lasse. And uh, Brooks appear. Yeah, Brooks is this is the uh, I'm not assembly. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I can. I'll check that. We'll and, check. And, that. and I just want to say that um, <clears throat> I probably have issues with with each one of these, but I really find it disturbing, and I don't know how to appropriately do it. when we're looking talking about safety critical issues uh, and put um, uh, devalue the value of human life, if you will. Uh, just doesn't make sense and, and uh, I guess my, my editorial is if many of these people that are represented as, uh, represent themselves as moralists and yet they they look at uh, at how they look at uh, the lives of uh, uh, their constituents and uh, their children it's really disturbing what the value system that they're showing us. 
it's very disturbing what was we find found frustrating we we found about found out about this a few days before last Thursday it was supposed to be a hearing starting at 12 30 all of a sudden it came 10 a.m. so those people further away from Madison than an hour and 15 minutes you know they, they had to do some quick maneuvering to get down there in time we waited to testify until I think three o'clock we sat there they don't put out an agenda it's just potluck and you sit there and you sit there in one group the group from that from Dane County that went on for at least two hours and they just talked and talked and talked and after lunch these guys this committee said well we're running short of time let's limit it to three minutes well it's it's that's not fair I mean and um, so I, I, I encourage everyone if you're watching or listening to this 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 meeting contact your local representative and tell you know, enough's enough I mean we want to run our city as we think best to run our city. We don't inter need interference on sort of one size fit all fits all legislation that, you know, Milwaukee is different than Bayfield. And let each let Milwaukee do their thing, let Bayfield do our their thing, let us do our thing. Did you did you think about asking our representatives to come in front of of people, whether it be the common council or whether and actually make them publicly show their position one way or another uh we have and not answer those questions that we have we have not we have a meeting with the legislators council legislators but that's a good point there they're going to vote for this before before your meeting i invited one of them no 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 i invited one of them to come to our workshop tonight i didn't hear back from that particular legislator. yeah well i mean it would, <laughs> it'd be nice to, to tell to ask them all to come in I would at one time and, and and have that and and explain to them say how, how are you justifying this if if they're in support of it how are you justifying this for <coughs> this particular reason this particular reason, this particular reason? how are you squaring your support for this particular yeah. measure with your previous votes on these types of topics yeah. that's what i that's what i'd like to know <coughs> i mean and, and how are how are you actually helping to protect the constituents that you supposedly say you're representing if you're voting for this that is the opposite of what we want now you're going to get some landlords come in and say hey i'm all for it yeah you know fewer than you'd suspect the, there are the, the good landlords good landlords understand the reason for the rental inspection and registration program one point i made when i was down there i said it knowing who owns what will save the taxpayers time and money because if there's a fire if something burns down we know who to contact you know the house that burned down on Ida and Franklin a few years ago it took Andrew Prickett forever to track down who owned it because of all the LLC so we he wasted two days of taxpayer dollars trying to find the owner you know when you see all the, the units there's you know junk on the porches and trash out and so forth you know we we need the information for more than, uh, I don't want to say policing, we need the information to help protect the owners of those properties too. And I think the good landlords understand that this will enable them probably to get a bit more for their units because they've been inspected. Uh, they Competitive re advantage for them. If they right, they've received the good housekeeping seal of approval, if you will, for lack of a better term. Bad landlords cost good landlords money. Exactly. I mean, that, that's exactly you know, that's right. the simplest way to put it, I guess. That's right. Every business. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. right. And, yeah. Bob? I have a question for staff. You might know. We used to have in the city employ a housing inspector that had jurisdiction in any properties <coughs> if there's a complaint. Mm -hmm. Do we still have one? Yes, and the bill doesn't affect that. The bill doesn't affect that ability. So if somebody still somebody calls us out uh, over a you know concern at a at a property, that we still have the right to go in there. We have to be invited in. Uh, so that is that we still do retain that. So in other words, in a case like Steve's, is your niece you said? A uh, niece is a friend. A friend. A friend that's living in an attic. We have to be invited. In. Madison, my brother lived in. I mean, <laughs> this is an ongoing problem. We, we, we have to be in. We, 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 <laughs> Unreal what he lived in. We have to be invited in by by the rent by the by the rent by the tenant. The, and the, the tenant can invite you in. Right? Yes. And Tom is right. You know, the, this the, the niece the signed the, the the lease a year before. And I said, can I see the lease? She showed it to me, and I I said, take pictures of this entire unit as you're moving in. The parents came up here to help her move in. They were absolutely 
livid. And it wasn't a money issue. It was right. like, how in the world could you do something like this? Something so irresponsible. But really, you know, once they're inside, we can't control where they're going in, in the house. I mean, that's just, I mean, the inspections, we'll see it. We can see if there's a living unit and that kind of stuff, and we can address it that. But once you get inside there, we can't really, you know, we can't manage that. We're not looking to actually manage that, but at least we want to get through there on occasion. All right. We've already probably spent more time on this than Madison yep. will. So. <laughs> but we've got, we feel better. <laughs> So the, I'll just go over these, these next two real quick. AB 583 would prevent the regulation of short-term private rentals. That means anything less than seven days, we couldn't address that at all. I think that's the language of the bill. David, correct? Correct. Um, and then AB 5, uh, 582, uh, there's, got, there's a lot of things in that bill. I think the one for, from our standpoint that affects us allows a property to vest their rights under local zoning by applying for a related permit, such as a driveway permit or a DNR permit. I think our concern mm -hmm. there is if you, get a, if you get a permit from another, from another body, you would get almost like what, blanket authorization for, yeah, the way, I still don't fully understand the way, that. The way I read it, if you receive a permit from any state or county agency, your zoning gets locked in at that time. You get vested rights to that zoning. So if the zoning changes over time, you are still, from as I read it, you're still held to the zoning you had when you got that original permit, even if it's not a permit from the city itself. So we couldn't change the zoning like we you can change. You can change the zoning, but they would still be regulated per the zoning when they got that permit. How is that? This is the one that I was a little confused about. Maybe we still are confused about it. Right. So how is that different? I mean, essentially, it, is it just we would then be creating a non-conforming? Uh, well, it wouldn't be non-conforming. We would have to keep track of our zoning code, like our code we have now, adopted in 1996. Right. And anybody who received a permit has the vested rights to that code. And then when we get a new code, I mean, it was developed under that code. Yes. Right. Then when we get a new code, um, we would have to keep that for any properties developed in that timeline, or received a permit in that timeline. You better hurry up on our. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it's still it still doesn't matter. <laughs> well, as long as they get a permit. <coughs> so, so an example would be you get a permit to put a boathouse from the DNR. Uh, everything, all local zoning on that property now gets locked into the time you got that permit. So let's say the setback is five feet, we increase it to seven feet, your setback still five feet. So if they have to rebuild if we if they need to rebuild not just the rebuild, building, no, new what I'm buildings. saying is if they rebuild the building, <coughs> they'd only have to set back five feet. Right. Or, or if, if they built if it's an undeveloped parcel that was approved with a five foot setback. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that applies to all properties. The way, the way I read it was even more yeah, strict. So really if weird. you have an undeveloped parcel and you get a DNR permit to, to firm up your shore, so you haven't developed anything on the property, but you got a permit to put in riprap or to do a, a seawall or something, that permit then locks you into that zoning of that time. I thought it was for everything in the jurisdiction as well, all your properties in the jurisdiction. Yeah, and it's for, and it's for every property you own in that jurisdiction, not just the one that's affected by that permit. Which is so kind we're of still confused on this one. So if you own 10 properties, you got a permit on one, they all get locked into the zoning at that time for all 10 that's, properties. That's one of the most bizarre it's things bizarre. I've probably ever encountered. What's that? But then it goes to the I mean, that, This is all pretty bizarre. So <laughs> you can yeah. Right. Uh, we I should, we should uh, well, move this yeah. along. David had a personal commentary to make before we leave here today. Yeah, I just wanted to, to recognize that uh, Dennis McHugh died. Yes. A past, really? uh, Past member of the plan commission was he past mayor? No. It was a city council, council school board. Past president of the council. school board as well. Yeah. School board. That was, but uh, he was certainly um, <coughs> an activist uh, member and uh, certainly stimulated uh, conversation uh, for the for the community. Past classmate of mine. He was a year younger, but we went to school together. And All right. Let's. We can keep call this off and get ready for the next one. Yep, five thirty over meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you.